Nate Silver uh, attacked us the other day. Why? That's fun. Okay, and he actually um, was a little over the top, to say the least. I'm not at all offended by it. Other people might be. Uh, in fact, I'm fairly amused by it. Uh, it was like he was trying to thump us or something. Like I'll show the bully, or <laughs> right, we'll find out who the bully is. We'll find out who's right. But I, he was full of. Vigor, let's put it that way. Uh, okay, here, I'm gonna let you uh, judge for yourself. So he talked about it on his podcast, not only that, he later tweeted it, like the quote you're about to hear. So he wasn't playing, he wanted to get our attention. Here's what he said. Let's start with the basics. Nate, what does it mean when you see N slash A among a particular demographic group in a poll's crosstabs? Well, to start with the basics, I mean, the young Turks are full of shit about this. And I hope that people see that and then they, and they're curious about why. Ooh, Nate, are you in my grill? <laughs> okay. Uh, ben Mangowitz, who I started the show with once, uh, said to Anna, actually, who was uh, trying to beat me in a race, and she started out fast, and she said, I was trying to intimidate him in the beginning. And Ben said, you're trying to intimidate the intimidator? <laughs> Good luck, Nate. Okay, so now, uh, let's get the substance of this. So we covered a... a uh, CNN poll on the show just last week, and uh, John gave the background. I'm going to show you exactly what he said to show you that we are right and Nate is wrong. Uh, and and uh, there was uh, different categories, age groups, which is very normal in a poll. And uh, there was a representative sample in the older demographics, and and the older demographics generally like Joe Biden. Uh, the younger demographics, they did not have a representative sample, uh, but they do actually use a multiplier on that. And and so Nate explained that in his podcast. I'll come back to it in a second. But it said NA is it not applicable. We explain that to our audience. That apparently is what set uh, Nate and his colleagues off because they thought we did not do a good job of explaining that. Again, in a second, I'm gonna show you the video so you'll have absolute proof that they are wrong. But first, more uh, chest thumping from Nate Silver. If you're implying to your audience that you're expert in these areas, and you're just wrong about stuff, then people's willingness to be wrong in cases where it's really relatively easy to determine kind of objectively, quote unquote, what's right and wrong versus like this next segment that we'll have where I'm sure half the audience will disagree with my view on impeachment, whatever else, that's a lot more complicated. But like polls are relatively simple facts. And like the fact that people get those wrong ought to worry you about kind of how much people are concerned about kind of actually getting the story right. Mm, I love that, thank you for that setup. Uh, so uh, if you get things that are uh, simple facts about polling, well, it does show you and maybe give you concern about what their real bias is, what their real concerns are. Uh, you know, And especially if you're an expert on a topic, like Nate is an expert on polling, that's why we had this conversation. And so by the way, uh, as you'll see in a minute, uh, do I dislike Nate Silver? No, not at all, I actually think he's, Significantly better than the rest, but we'll give you that context in a second. Um, so, but he wasn't done yet, and and I've got to show you this because this is where he explains why we got it wrong. So I want you to pay real close attention to what he says we got wrong, because then I'm going to show you what we actually said. Let's watch. If I were CNN, I'd probably say, you know what? Because people make even more idiotic statements if you list N A and don't understand the poll at all. And some people literally think that CNN just didn't even bother to pull anyone under the age of 50. I probably list the estimates for young voters with all the noise attached. So, you know, you've got the uh, over the top statements again, idiotic. Uh, earlier, he said full of crap. Uh, he uh, said we're just wrong. But if you notice, the substance of the attack was there. He said, when people say that they did not, the poll did not count people under the age of 50 at all. Now, let's go to the tape that they, he is referring to, the segment he's referring to. And and, there's, and Nate is so biased, they actually played this clip on their own podcast. And then he's like, he didn't hear what he didn't want to hear. So listen to what John Iderola says in the setup. And listen to whether he says they did actually count people under the age of 50. Watch. What you will notice immediately is that as you go down, that's a whole bunch of different candidates. There's a lot of NAs, and the NAs are in the categories of people between 18 to 34 and 35 to 49. Now, a lot of people notice that relatively quickly. Now, that does not mean that they did not have any respondents in those age ranges. They did. It just means that there weren't enough for them to consider it to be a sort of representative sample for opinions held by those people. There's just not enough of them. And overall, it means that the results 
overall are gonna be a good bit biased because what you are really polling in actuality are not people, it's the oldest age groups in America. And is it a shock that they might prefer Joe Biden over some of the other candidates? And again, it doesn't mean by itself that he did not experience some sort of bump or that that bump might not be sustainable or they might not find in other places. But the headlines never said Joe Biden gets big bump from poll of septuagenarians. It says <laughs> Joe Biden up big, pack this thing in, it's done. So John gave several important caveats there, but the most important one is the one that Nate was addressing. He said, it's not like they didn't count young people, they did. That You saw it with your own eyes, John just said that in the clip. Nate listens to that, says, I don't like the Young Turks, generally don't like progressives much. So I'm gonna ignore that he said that, and I'm going to not only pretend that he didn't say it, I'm gonna go on a whole 15 minute rant on my podcast, and then I'm going to tweet that the Young Turks are full of crap, because I don't like them. So that's the reality of Nate's bias. So here, then I, on Twitter, I said last night, we'll be addressing Nate's smear of us on tomorrow's show. Great irony in claiming we didn't explain a poll correctly, not true, as you just saw with your own eyes, and then not correctly explaining what we said. Nate, what are you going to admit your establishment bias? I'm gonna get back to that in a second. Then of course, Kyle jumps in, Kyle Kalinske's host of Secular Talks, a giant show on YouTube and other platforms. You should check it out, it is part of the TYT network. And he's a little brasher than I am, believe it or not. And he says, hi, data boy, and then <laughs> referring to Nate. And then you can't see the full tweet there, but the headlines are all about how Nate Silver got uh, the Trump uh, wrong during the Republican nomination. And so Nate was of course upset about that. Now he's acknowledged that in the past, but it still gets under his skin. Uh, and he tweeted this in response, he said, um, predictions are one thing, uh, we've been doing this for a long time and the track record shows we got things right more often than not, by the way, which is true, which is not to say always, but facts are another. And you all ought to stop misinforming readers about basic facts about polls. Nate, uh, given what we just showed you, right back at you, brother. Uh, and, and then finally, uh, I, on this note, I wanted to say, look, if, and I listened to the rest of Nate's podcast, if they had come back with a critique that was justified and factual, I would have said, oh, that's interesting and that's a, a interesting point. Like if they had said, no, the Young Turks didn't say anything wrong, or, uh, but uh, I wish they would have added that, yes, they do count young people in that poll, just like John said, but there's also a weighting system which makes sure that even though they're not a representative sample, that it, they at least try to get it to catch up uh, to the other demographic groups which are properly represented. That would have been an interesting critique of not what we said, but what we didn't say. Okay, that would have been fair, but that's not what he said. Because again, he doesn't like being wrong and, and he has been wrong. And, and so in fact, did we even say like, you heard John say there's other polls. I went on to emphasize that more later in the clip. I don't know if you watched the whole clip, but if you're gonna go out and tell the whole world that somebody's full of crap, I think you do have an obligation not to watch, I'm not pulling a Sam Harris, you have to watch every video we've ever done in our lives, otherwise you're taking us out of context, but at least finish that video and see if we gave further context. So in reality, here's what I said later in that same segment, watch. There are other polls, like the poll that we pointed out, the CNN one, it's got a massive issue as you can tell. But Biden is picking up steam, that makes sense, he just announced and he actually did a good, a good political strategy with the pointing out Charlottesville, Trump attacked him, that's gonna lift up his numbers. You can talk about that and be do it in a fair way. I thought Warren's policy proposals would do well, I've been telling you for about a week on the show, if not more, that her numbers would start to go up and they have. And that's also shown in the same polls and she's gone up about three points and, and now she's solidly in third place, so, so that's real, and they do mention that as well. And and look, it, it, so I like Elizabeth Warren a lot, I like Bernie Sanders a lot. I told you if I like someone, I tell you, there it is, right? And and Bernie Sanders, I'm so, for a while, looked like he was gonna overtake Biden, and I thought that made sense, logic, politically, let alone what I like, think about his policy. Now, he's not in, in, in as commanding a second place as I would have thought, mm -hmm. And I point that out, and I, it's you, it's two different hats. One is who do you think is right on the policy, and the other is what's actually happening. What's the reality on the ground? We thought Trump might win. We couldn't stand Trump, but 
but we gave you the actual numbers and talked about likely versus versus not. So it, it's it is I have to confess it is frustrating where we say we're homo progressives. We clearly label who we are. We talk honestly about our point of view, and then we actually analyze the numbers because it's our job to give you facts. And they call us biased. Then they turn around and have an actual bias where they put the numbers in a skewed perspective to favor their own candidates. And then when you point it out, they get all hurt and emotional over it. Now remember, I said that before Nate Silver got all hurt and emotional over it. <laughs> and then he went on to fulfill that prophecy nearly perfectly. So thank you, Nate, I appreciate it. So the reason sometimes progressives get agitated is because the establishment is constantly demeaning towards progressives. Dismissive of people like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and their supporters. And when we put, point out facts, they get really agitated. And, and we're not doing it based on who we like and don't like. So for example, when we show you Bernie Sanders did better with independence than Hillary Clinton in 2016. We didn't say that because we made up the numbers, those were real polls. But every pundit on television, who all of them are worse than Nate, but would go on and say, no, my gut says independence would like a really corporate candidate like Hillary Clinton. Based on what, <laughs> right? No, the polling indicates independence like Bernie Sanders. But even Nate on issues, especially when it came to Trump, but oftentimes when it comes to Bernie Sanders, ignores numbers that he doesn't like. He, he Or more accurately, that bother him, that don't fit his narrative. and. And I don't think that Nate even realizes he has a narrative. He thinks, "What? No, I just, no, I'm just for the." As Jay Rosen, a great media critic from NYU, says, "The view from nowhere." I'm I'm the objective guy. That you know what that does? That privileges his point of view as the correct perspective, and that's just not true. You have a perspective, and it is not necessarily the correct one. And it is so easy and lazy. To say, well, the conservatives are obviously biased, and the progressives are obviously biased, and they're both obviously wrong. Whereas, hey, lucky me, my perspective, the establishment one, the one that is in favor of the status quo and believes the status quo, is the correct one. No, it is not, and facts have shown it otherwise, especially in the case of Trump. So he, he says that we do it based on our bias and that when we just do prognostication. I'm gonna show you a clip here from 2016 when I criticized Nate for the first time. And you'll notice again, it's tempered and it's about the facts. And it's about Donald Trump, who I am not biased in favor of. The exact opposite, I loathe him. I think he is deeply incompetent, one of the dumbest guys alive, enormously malicious. I don't know that there is a critic of Donald Trump in the country more than I am, and or harsher against Donald Trump than I am, okay? But nonetheless, I saw the numbers because while we're honest about our perspective, we have to give you reality in terms of the facts. So now watch this clip from 2016. Keep in mind these things. Nate Silver, all the way in November of 2015, had Donald Trump's chance of winning at six, winning the Republican nomination at 6%. When all the polling indicated he had a significant lead. Now in October of that same year, a month before Nate had it at 6%, I said Donald Trump would win the Republican nomination. Well, let me show you that the clip from later on in the process. Now, this is during the general election, but many months before election day. And I explained the whole context of it back then. Here, watch. Nate Silver, um, until this election cycle, had been known as a fairly excellent prognosticator. One of the guys who would say that is me. Uh, and I defended him throughout the 2012 election. Uh, idiots like Joe Scarborough would go on the air and go, oh, Nate Silver's polling is incorrect. My gut says the American people will pick Mitt Romney. <laughs> Your gut isn't worth squat. It isn't worth the squat in it. <laughs> Nate Silver had numbers. Unfortunately, in this election cycle, Nate's lost track of the numbers and he can't see past his own bias. So he gave a, a Trump a 2% chance of nomination, was spectacularly wrong. Here they say, but Silver pointed out that Trump's general election numbers have still remained consistent, whereas primary voting numbers have not. Now, he says, "Oh, in the primary, it was hard to predict because he's going up and down. Actually, he was fairly consistently number one. That's why back in June of 2015, I said he was definitely gonna be in the top three. And then by October of 2015, before 
months before any of the voting, I bet that he would win the nomination. Now, I what, what did I base that on? My gut? No, I'm not an idiot like a TV pundit. I, funny enough, I based it on the polls. And I also based it on how he was campaigning and the mood of the country. Now you say in the general election though, totally consistent numbers. Really? Let me show you the polling. Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. That's real clear politics average of polls. Does that look consistent to you? Now forget the left side of that. That's in the primaries that they're not head to head, etc. But let look starting around April, right? What the hell is consistent about those numbers? Hillary Clinton's got a big lead, Donald Trump dips, then he rises, and then he rises more, and then he passes her, and then he dips again. What part of that is consistent enough for Nate Silver to say that? No, that's it. Well, let's wrap this election up. Hillary Clinton has an 80% chance to win. <sighs> wrong again, Nate. And that did prove to be wrong. But <clears throat> again, I want to give context here. Nate was better off than the New York Times, Huffington Post, and almost every other outlet. On election day, the only people who were saying that Trump had a better chance of winning than Nate Silver, as far as I could tell, on the national scene was us. Um, and that is why, and there's plenty of famous videos about that floating around on the internet uh, with lots of views where Ben and I say brace for impact. Uh, and, and because Trump can really win this thing. But I remember Huffington Post had Hillary Clinton's chance of winning at 98.4%. And Nate said, no, that's not true. His chances are higher, but not that high. And, and so he's a little off there or significantly off, but better than the rest. And that's really important. But I wanna again clarify the difference between right wing critics, MSM critics of Nate Silver and us. The right wing doesn't care about facts at all. So they look at numbers and science go, <laughs> science, no, my God. In other words, Donald Trump doesn't believe in numbers. Okay, I mean, how do you have a conversation with people who don't speak the same language? So by the way, don't just learn English, learn math. Um, so then you got the mainstream media uh, who says, "Oh, Nate's a nerd, and you know he's just focusing on numbers." And no, my gut, my gut says I went to a cocktail party, and all my millionaire friends said, uh, "They uh, tax cuts for the rich is really unpopular. The country's really center right, and they don't like tax." Or you could look at a poll, and it says 76% of the country wants tax increases for the rich. But everybody on TV is rich, so they don't look at that poll. Instead, they tell you the exact opposite of what's true, alternative facts. So their critique of Nate is easy to dismiss. Our critique, I think, is less easy to dismiss. And that is maybe part of the reason why he's agitated. And do I know Nate Silver's politics? Do I know who he's gonna vote for? No, I have some clues in the podcast. Every one of them referred to progressives as they. And with a little dismissive tone in their voice, like, I mean, that's what they believe. Those people on the left, they, and they would do false equivocation and say things like they're like the people on the right. Really? We have lunatics on the right wing who don't even believe in climate change. They believe 99% of the world's scientists got together and created a conspiracy. I mean, you should be locked up in an insane asylum if you believe that. Whereas we say, hey, perhaps you have a bias maybe you're not even aware of. And he's like, oh my God, you're full of crap. You're just like Trump. Oh, come on. You see, you are betraying your own bias there. So what is his bias? Well, he, partly it's things that are somewhat understandable if he would ever uh, open up and listen. He, he looks at the history of polling, but times are different. And, and so he has a thesis that the party usually picks uh, the winner. Well, that is true if you look at the past, but that was before a populist wave came in, not just in America, but all across the world. So I thought Corbyn would do Way better, even in fact, I said I thought he would win. That was an audacious comment when he was down 24 points in, in the UK with six weeks left to go. As it turns out, he didn't win, and we acknowledge when we don't get it right, but he did close the lead by about 20 points in six weeks, which was stunning. And why? If you just looked at the polling ahead of Corbyn's election, you would have said, hey, uh, the UK just voted for Brexit, which is right wing. So they'll, of course, they'll never go for Corbyn. That misunderstands. The current political dynamic all across the world, it isn't left versus right, it's populist versus establishment. But Nate has not caught up to that and almost no one in the mainstream media has caught up to that. So they look at it and go, well, obviously the guys who won before, the guys with the polished suits and the nice haircut and all the consultants and the ones that the party favors and the establishment favors are the ones more likely to win. And that is why he got Trump wrong too, and he admits it So, and to his credit. He wrote an article later after uh, all this, he said, how I acted like a pundit and screwed up on Donald Trump. And he gave details, he said, unlike uh, virtually every other forecast we published at 538, 
including the primary and caucus projections I just mentioned, our early estimates of Trump's chances weren't based on a statistical model. Instead, they were what we subjective odds, which is to say educated guesses. But Nate, that's exactly what we were telling you. But you were so hurt by that that you lash out against us. I believe, and you know, obviously I could be biased too, but the only ones giving you a legitimate critique that you might actually you know, learn from. And I don't want it to sound arrogant because he's still making the same mistakes. I'll give you one last quote, a part of his mea culpa. And you have to give him credit for the mea culpa. People on TV never bother apologizing when they get it wrong, and they get it wrong nine out of 10 times. So he said, in other words, we were basically acting like pundits. But attaching numbers to our estimates, and we succumb to some of the same biases that pundits often suffer, such as not changing our minds quickly enough in the face of new evidence. See, Nate, that's what we're asking you to do now. Without a model as a fortification, we found ourselves rambling around the countryside like all other pundit barbarians randomly setting fire to things. So that's right, but Nate, you're still not past it. And in fact, even in that same analysis, he talked about Trump is a one off. Why does he think that? Because everybody in Washington thinks that. Everybody in New York thinks that. Oh, no, no, no. we're gonna get back to normal. Oh, Biden's gonna come in or Kamala Harris or someone. This is just an aberration. We, we don't see it in any of the rest of the historical numbers for the last 20 years, etc. Yeah, that's why if you were right about them, then Martin O'Malley would have given Hillary Clinton a run for her money instead of Bernie Sanders. Open your eyes, the country is in a populist mood, both on the right and the left. And progressives are deeply, deeply popular. And look at your own polling when you go policy by policy. Medicare for all, 70%. Social Security protecting it is at 84%. Raising tax on the rich is 76%. I can give you literally dozens of polls where the country is not center left, it's massively left. But even Nate Silver, who should know better, and that's why I criticize him in this context, because we need you to get the numbers right. You're not like you're not supposed to be like the other guys. Looks at the numbers and says, "I don't believe my lying eyes." So these people on the left are fringe, radical, extreme, etc. Now, now I don't want to describe those exact words from him to Bernie Sanders, but you could feel that disdain in his writing, but more importantly, in his analysis. And that and and if he doesn't get it straightened out, he'll get this election wrong too. And then he'll have to write another mea culpa and go, well, I mean, nobody could have seen Bernie Sanders coming. I mean, that's impossible, who would know? I, I did a video in 2013 saying Bernie Sanders could beat Hillary Clinton. Why, because I really love Bernie Sanders? No, because I can, I'm telling you now, based on both the polling, which I can see with a clear eye, and yes, other factors such as the feedback we're getting from the audience, and I know that that's skewed, of course, of course, right? And, but. You get a sense that people are angry, they're angry about wages. And so we predicted those things many years ago. Because you, could, it's not that we're any smarter than anyone else, it's just that we actually care to listen to people who are telling us those things, whether they're on the right, left, or middle. And so again, populism will rise. And if you counter with an establishment candidate, you'll be making the same exact mistake you made in 2016. And so repeating that mistake, is exactly what the mainstream media is doing, saying, "Oh yeah, 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 no." You see, that's Hillary Clinton lost. Why? Because she was an establishment. No, 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 no. Because of Bernie Sanders. What? Bernie Sanders had a 12-point lead on election day in 2016. Now, could that have been whittled down because they would have run ads against them? Of course, of course. They always treat progressives as children. No, we're arguably more sophisticated than you. But what I do know is. They would have had to whittle down a 12 point lead. It would have been incredibly difficult. We know Hillary Clinton lost. Bernie Sanders would have had a significantly better chance of winning. And the same is true today. If you run Biden, that's the same as running Hillary, and you're gonna make that same mistake. Now, I'm not ascribing those views to Nate Silver, but when he looks at it from the perspective that he does, unfortunately, I think that it encourages and buttresses the mainstream media into going, oh yeah, that's right, of course. America doesn't want a progressive, America's the center right country. That's why Biden reaching out to Mitch McConnell and Dick Cheney is a great idea. No, it is not a great idea. And as you will see in this primary season, it will prove to be a very, very bad idea. And Joe Biden will fade because that is not where the Democratic Party is. It's also not where the country is. Last thing is, I've asked Nate Silver to come on the show. I hope that he comes on and we have a good conversation about it. 
Uh, it's up to him uh, if he wants to have an honest conversation about it. But this is the reality and this was a real critique. And we weren't the ones who made up uh, facts. Unfortunately, on his podcast, he was the one that made up facts about us. So who's the biased one, Nate? Thanks for watching this free clip of the Young Turks. Don't forget to become a TYT member today. For more exclusive content, join now at tyt.com slash join.